My name is Barry Clark. I'm Managing Director of Taylor & Francis Asia Pacific here in Singapore. Um, and I'm just delighted that uh, you were able to come this afternoon. Thank you very much to our event, which is the... Can you all hear me? I don't need a mic, do I? No, that's fine. Thank you, Pat. Um, which is the launch of the SAP Asia Archive. I won't do full introductions, because I think most of you know the panel very well, but there's a few people that you won't know so well. But first I'd like to welcome Kwaria and Shamishtra, who have come from India directly, I believe, arrived at the weekend. Yeah. And you're here for a few other reasons during this week. Um, and obviously the South Asia Archive is very much thanks to their tremendous work over the years, and we'll be hearing a good story about the South Asia Archive in due course. So I... Not hearing, is that bad? No, you turned out really hard. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll try and face more front. Thank you. Okay, I'll take the mic then. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Okay, is that better? No. No. <laughs> That's better, I hope. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Well, it's always scary hearing one's own voice on a microphone. <laughs> So Bora and Shamistra, thank you very much for coming, welcome. And we have a distinguished panel of uh, experts, of academics, that I think you all know very well, Robin, uh, Riaz and Ganesh, um, all from the National University of Singapore, Institute of South Asian Studies. Um, so again, thank you very much for acting as panelists, and they will be looking at the South Asia Archive a little later on. Last but not least, we have Sarah Phillips. Sarah will be demonstrating the South Asia Archive in a moment. She is in charge of developing archives such as this. Um, we've got several archives in the works, and this is very much part of Taylor and Francis's new direction. We continue to be the major journal publisher in the social sciences with a very strong science portfolio as well, and we continue to be a book publisher, textbooks, monographs, handbooks, companions. But we are now developing our skill sets to develop resources, to archive resources at libraries all around the world to bring to the public, to bring to the academic attention material that is otherwise may have been lost and forgotten. So on that note, I'd like to introduce Sarah and ask you to do a demonstration. Yeah, okay. You. Do you need a mic? Um, can everyone hear me? Or would you prefer? Yes, yes. Okay. So today I'm going to talk a little about the content of the South Asia Archive before moving on to the functionality and the features of the product itself. So it, the resource contains 5 million pages of unique and rare primary and secondary source material all sourced from the South Asia Research Foundation and it dates from 1700 through to 1953. The collection covers the Indian subcontinent, including Pakistan, Burma, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. And a significant proportion of the collection is in English, but 15% of the documents are in vernacular languages, including Bengali and Sanskrit. The product has been designed as both a research and a teaching resource. The digital collection contains 16 different document types. And these vary from government acts, legal documents, film pamphlets, maps, journals, magazines, and statistics, to name but a few. And here's a few examples of, the, of some of the documents in the resource. So moving on to the collection breakdown. There is a substantial run of more than 300 journals, such as the Asiatic Researchers, Indian Review, Modern Review, and the Calcutta Gazette. There is also a selection of vernacular journals available in the resource. Reports. These are indispensable for any work on colonial and post-colonial Indian history. And examples include Muslim Chamber of Commerce and the Calcutta Disturbances of 1947. There's also a vast range and number of rare books consisting of some series, such as the Bibliotheca Indica, legal documents, including legislations, acts, regulations and case documents, all from the colonial area, and Indian film booklets that range from 1933 through to 1953. These very rare and unique publicity materials, such as programmes and ephemera relating to and advertising Indian film, some of which are the only surviving record that some of the films ever existed, the films themselves having either been lost or destroyed over time. This collection of material allows for exploration and research across six key themes. First is partition and independence. 
there is an abundance of periodicals and journals that provide contemporary reaction to partition and independence, including the Calcutta Gazette, the All Indian Reporter and the Eastern Economist as well as the constitutional proposals of the SAPRU committee. Second is crime, riot and resistance. Sample documents covering this theme include the proceedings of the 1894 Indian Hemp Commission, the Bengal Jail Code for 1920, rulings of the High Court in criminal cases for 1891, and Cecil Henry Walsh's Indian Village Crimes, published in 1929. Colonial Knowledge and Colonial Governance, there are numerous government department reports covering areas such as production, agriculture and governance, including titles like the Royal Commission on the Public Services in India of 1916. Print and the production of culture. Relevant documents include reports of the Calcutta Literary Society, articles published in significant literary journals, for example, the article South India in Present Day Fiction, published in 1938, as well as early Indian film ephemera, which I've already um, spoke a little bit about. Religious and moral discourse, numerous reports, journals and periodicals, including the Islamic Review, the Quarterly Journal of the Mythic Society, and the Hindu Patrika, a Bengali title. And finally, for the theme Commerce, Technology and Development, relevant documents include reports of the Board of Economic, Economic Inquiry, reports of the Indian jute mills, the Burma Trade Journal, and annual reports of the Department of Commercial Intelligence and Statistics. Here's a couple more images from the digital resource. The image on the left is a cotton map of India displaying cotton production by province and state for the years 1918 to 1919. And the image on the right is the front cover of a Bengali magazine published in Calcutta in 1947. So moving on to the functionality aimed at content discovery that we developed in the product. So this is the Explore content page. It provides a full list of all of the content available in the archive which users can browse through. On this page, users can also filter the complete list by document type, subject and language. Language options are English, Bengali and Sanskrit. Documents can be viewed by clicking on the document title or the View Images button to the right of the title. And the menu bar at the left of the page offers the user the option of filtering the content of the archive by document type, subject area and language. The bottom of the menu has been cut off in the screenshot, but the options are listed there. So when a document has been selected, the Document Details page will open. The document details page includes the first image of the document and top level metadata, including publication title, document type, language, publisher, region, date and subject. And where applicable, a list of all the sections and chapters within the document is listed. On this page, users can download PDFs of an entire document or individual chapters and can also suggest keywords and commentaries which are moderated by the editors, Dr. Shamisa Guptu and Dr. Brian Majumda before being displayed on the site. The option to add documents to the personalized My Account area is also available. And to view the entire document in the Im image viewer, users just click the View Images link or the thumbnail image. And then that will take you nicely to the example image viewer page. So in the browse image viewer, users can view the full pages as shown in the screenshot or the image thumbnails. You can also jump to specific sections within a document and utilise the zoom functionality to increase and decrease the size of the image or toggle to a full page view. Users also have the option to download a specific page range within the document and browse easily through the document by clicking next image. So let's move on to searching. The advanced search page enables high level and granular searching. Options available on the advanced search are multiple search drop downs, including the full text, title, author, keyword and publisher and multiple filter options, so you can filter by document type, subject area, language and publication date. All of these options have been developed to enable users to perform focused, granular and specific searching. So once you've performed a search, the list of returned search results is split across two tabs listing results for sections and publication titles. The search results page displays the basic metadata including the document and section title, the author, publisher and date of publication, 
and the search term is highlighted, as you can see in the screenshot. Users have the option to refine their search even further by date range, document type, subject and language. And on this page, you can also search, save your search to your My Account area, download PDFs of the entire document or a specific section, and view the search terms in context before actually opening up the document. So that leads us nicely on to the Keywords in Context feature, which displays excerpts from the top five most relevant results within a document or section with the search term highlighted. This allows the user to view the location of a search term in a document before opening it. Selecting to view a particular excerpt via the view link will open the page within the search results image viewer. And here's the example image viewer with search result highlighted. On this page, users can click through to the previous or the next search hit, or click to the next or previous page. And you also have the option to click through to the next issue where relevant. So all of the options that are available on the Browse Image Viewer page are also available here. You can jump to specific sections or chapters within the document. You can download page ranges and add documents to your personalised My Account area. Moving on to the related content feature. This is an ex excellent feature which lists material that is relevant to the top document that you are browsing. And this, this feature facilitates discoverability and exploration of the content within the resource. So the related content um, bar on the right of the screen will show up documents that are relevant to the document that you are um, browsing that you might not otherwise find um, in the resource. So it's just highlighting more content. So moving on to the content tools designed to enrich the user experience. Users can register to create their own accounts and once signed in, they can add documents to their archive. So documents can be saved for easy access and can be returned to to research at a later stage. Documents saved to my archive can also be downloaded and sent to colleagues and students, thus providing a useful teaching tool. And this is the My Account landing page, where you can manage your personal details, access, to, access your saved searches, and view documents saved to your archive. As mentioned earlier, registered users can also submit commentaries for any document. All commentaries will be moderated by our expert editors before being displayed on the site. Keywords aid discoverability of the vernacular language material, as well as providing useful metadata for users who can also suggest keywords for any document. Again, all submissions will be moderated before being displayed on the site. Crowdsourcing in this way will help the site to grow organically, enabling users to interact with the documents and develop a sense of community around the archive, as well as providing an avenue for scholarly interaction. And just to end with a couple of quotes. Of the South Asia Archive, Professor Ved Prakash remarks that the editorial input the archive has benefited from is a core strength. It has been prepared by experts who have worked on the subjects related to South Asia and are aware of the needs of the young researcher. And in closing, I will leave you with Dr. David Washbrook's observation that the archive represents an invaluable opportunity for students everywhere to have access to important and original historical sources. It should open a new window on India's recent past and raise standards of knowledge and research. India can now take its full place in the syllabus of modern history. So now I'll just run through a, um, a live demo of the actual site. Page. So once you've signed in, this is the first page that you'll come to. And you can either um, go straight to explore content, which, will, which is like a browsing page, and it'll list all of the documents within the archive. Or you can browse content by subject. So if you're um, interested in language and linguistics, for example, you can just go straight to all of the documents um, relevant to that, to that subject area. You can also see what people are searching for. So this is the top 10 list of all the most recent searches, and that's updated, um, well, it's updated live, so as people are searching. 
And then you've also got some information, some introductory information about the South Asia archive and then general guides. So if we go to the explore content page, this is the full browsing list that you'll see. And here you can sort, you can sort um, the browse list and you can also filter by document type, subject area and language. And the document type of each of the each of the documents is given here. So this is a report, for example. And then if you wanted to view to view a document, you just either click on the title or click on view images. And that will take you to the document <coughs> details page where you've got the top level metadata here. And you've got a list of all the chapters or sections within that particular document. You can also suggest keywords and commentaries via these links. So if you wanted to go straight to the publication, you'd click on the, either the thumbnail image or the view images button. Or if you wanted to go straight to a chapter or section, you just click on the title and that will take you directly through to that chapter. And here you've got your, related, your list of related content. So this is other content. Um, in the actual archive that is relevant to the document that you've chosen to look at. So if you go on to view images, before we click onto there actually, I'll just draw, draw, draw your attention to the fact that you can download the PDF on this page. Um, you can download the citation or you can add it to your archive. Okay, so this is the image viewer, and you can easily scroll in with the mouse. So it's really high resolution images. Um, they're very, very clear. You can also view the thumbnails, or you can jump to other sections within the, within the document itself. You can download page ranges, um, and then you can click through to your next page. And then the advanced search. I'll just run an example search. So I'm going to search for women and education. And you can also filter by document type or subject area. And you can change and, and the publication dates. So I'm searching for women and education between 1700 and 1871. Okay. And this is the list of, of search results. And again, if you wanted to filter your results even further, then you can sort them here and you can sort by document type title, publication date, author name, and you can always um, change the publication date as well. You can also save your search to your My Account area, and you can review the hits via the con keywords in context feature. And from there, you can go straight, straight to a relevant page. So here you can see your, your search hit is um, highlighted and you can then scroll onto the next hit within the document. My is taking a little time. <laughs> And then if we go to the My Account area, so I've already um, registered and signed in, and once you register and sign in, sign in, you'll go to this home page where you can edit your personal details, you can 
save your searches and you can go to your archive. So searches that I've saved previously are listed here. And if I clicked on one of those, it would bring back all the search results for that search. And again with my archive, this is a list of documents that I've saved to my archive area. And this is really great when you haven't got the time to spend researching the actual documents as you're searching through the resource. You can save them to your My Archive and come back to them in your own time when you've got the time to then actually research the document that you've saved. Um, and these are two that I think our panellists wanted me to, to click on, so I don't know whether you want to comment on any of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah? okay. Yeah. Do you want me to keep them up yeah, for you? Can. Yeah, that's fine. Um, here we go. Okay, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gloria, would you like to uh, continue just a little bit of history as well? Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, firstly, my turn to just say a few thank yous. Pleasure to come here. Most of the panelists are personally known to me. Robin and I go back a long way to Australia, then several other parts of the world. Gyanesh was my host when I first uh, came and spoke at the National University of Singapore in 2005. So a personal thank you to all of my panelists, Professor Hassan and obviously Shor Mishta. Sarah for taking time over. She came in last evening to sort of survive and give you the presentation that she did and not collapse out of jet lag. Takes quite a bit of doing. What I'll do is uh, I'll just give you a brief two to three minute history as to where this archive originated from and what is the story? How did we happen to do this archive and why? And then throw it open to my panelists. The way I want to structure this panel for the next one hour is this. I'll ask each of my panelists to make their introductory comments. And once they do that, I want to try and engage my panelists into a discussion to try and make it as interactive as possible for about 45 to 50 minutes, and then open it up for any number of questions. So whatever you all want to ask of any of us and Sarah, including uh, perhaps you want to check anything from the archive live, please feel free to do that. So that's what I want to do over the course of the next one hour, 20 minute period. How did the South Asia archive come about? You know, we, we joke saying a lot can be done over coffee. It was actually done over coffee. 2004, University of Oxford, we were having a chat, Shor Mishta, David Boschbrook and I, at a cafe just off behind St. Anthony's College in Oxford. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. And David Washbrook, who happened to be my supervisor at that point in time, currently colleague, tells me that the Chinese government has made online 4 million pages of material. This was 2003 four. And I'm like, awesome, because all of us who've done work on South Asia know how difficult it is to access, access archival material. So I'm like, let's do it for India. Let's do it for South Asia. And he's like, are you joking? And I'm like, no, let's try it. I mean, some, at some point in time, someone has to give this a shot. So we go back to India, and that starts the quest to build the South Asia archive. We really had no direction, being completely honest. We had no direction where this would go. We just started building up an archive, building up a, a collection of resource. Over the next two to three years, we had built up an entire corpus of material, 10 to 12 million pages of material, which is now part of the South Asia Research Foundation. That's when we got in touch with Taylor and Francis, and here you go, five years down the line, we have the South Asia archive. I'll tell you a couple of stories as to how the collection evolved. You know, we went to a rare, rare book dealer in Calcutta, a story I was sharing with Barry and Gyanesh just about 15, 20 minutes back. And this is a really good story. I mean, I go, I personally sort of, the way we divided the work is Shomishta is the hands-on editor who's done the editorial work for the archive and I was the person who was doing the acquisitions and building the archive. So I go to this very rare book uh, collector in Calcutta, uh, sweltering heat in the summer, May, June, 40 degrees, heat, humidity. And I go there and say, you know, I've heard that you've got this entire collection of journal material going back to the 19 teens and 1920s. Can I take a look at these? And he's like, he calls his assistant and tells him, please take him to the bathroom. And I'm like, bathroom? So I actually go there and believe me, over the cistern are two blocks of bricks, okay? And above that, right up to the roof are these journals. I've got photographs. So I, I stayed there for the next two to three hours looking at this material. It is quite strange as to how this material has been collected and in what state they were. What you were seeing are, are cleaned up images. Half of them were sort of soiled with pinholes, damaged, destroyed. Each of you have worked with archives, you know what I'm talking about. 
So the South Asia archive has been a very difficult thing to put together. The other story, I mean, we, we were collecting uh, very, very rare material. I mean, this, this is outstanding material. Take the, take the film pamphlets, and I'll talk about sport myself. You know, cricket material dating back to the 1940s, 30s, 1940s. It is almost impossible to get. Almost impossible to get. The Board of Control for Cricket in India has no archive. If you go to any library of, you know, worth its, take the Lord's Library or the British Library, hardly any material in Indian sport or Indian cricket. You come across this material in the hands of private collectors who have no idea what they're talking about. So to collect them and bring them together under one aegis, under one umbrella, has taken quite a bit of doing. So that's basically the genesis and the origins of the South Asia Archive. I can talk more about it as and when we, we sort of, you know, talk uh, during the question session. So with that, if I could get uh, Shormishta to come and comment on the editorial features, the editorial strengths of the archive, and then sort of I'll get each of my panelists to, con to comment on, because they've, they've had access to the archive, so they know, uh, you know, they've played with the archive for, for a while, so each of them can make their introdu introductory comments. Shormishta. Uh, so as uh, Borea has said, uh, this archive has been involved several years of very hard work on our part. Uh, sourcing the materials, collecting them, preserving them, and then the whole process of digitization, archiving, and then putting together the archive as you see it here, you know, in the form of, uh, you know, a comprehensive thing. So this has taken quite a bit of doing, and um, uh, going forward, we see this as a very enabling and effective research and teaching tool for South Asianists at various levels. Uh, faculty, researchers, students at various levels, graduate students and even undergraduates and uh, you know depending on your area ex of expertise and I hope uh, each of you in the room will at some point have a chance to play with the archive and uh, again depending on your area of expertise if you're about to write a research paper you could just sit there at your desktop and write, write your research paper without actually having to make a trip to the library or, uh, you know, you might well find that if you're writing your dissertation or if you're writing your book, you might be able to, you know, write a large part of it or a couple of chapters maybe. And I'm not saying here one bit that it does away with or diminishes the importance of the physical archive. It, it doesn't. At the same time, it allows you to maximize the experience of the physical archive because oftentimes as graduate students or even if you're a you know, more senior researcher, you know, when you set out to research a new topic and uh, going by the notorious uh, you know, unuser friendliness of Indian libraries, it's best to have a resource like this which you can play with which you can access and you know which documents you actually want to look at and then you know when you go to a library you can supplement it with other documents so it's a very good starting out tool and then you know even going further you could as i said depending on your area of expertise you could actually write a good part of your thesis or book from this archive so um yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I'd just like to keep my introductory comments very brief. And, oh, I didn't mention about the undergraduate part of it, which is that, you know, as graduate students, you're obviously expected to work with primary sources. So, uh, but as undergraduates, I've heard, uh, you know, colleagues say that, you know, I wish we could uh, get undergraduates to work with some primary materials, you know, which is actually not possible. So this archive is actually going to allow, you know, at the teaching level, you know, faculty to assign some primary materials to students at, you know, a lower level than even the graduate students. So it's, it can actually fundament, fundamentally change classroom teaching and then, you know, going upwards, you know, it's open for everyone. So I'd, I'd like to pass on to Robin for his comments. Oh, uh, thank you, Shamashta. Uh, just in playing with it as someone who's been trying to be a historian for the last too many years. Uh, I'm fearful that they've, uh, Sharmista and Borea and the members of the team, they've taken all the fun out of doing history. I mean, there'll be no excuse for sort of sticking one's nose into people's trunks and back rooms. I mean, the, the uh, story that Borea describes of going into the bathroom or the toilet and seeing beautiful stacked up 
rare thing sitting there. That experience is going to be denied to us now because uh, universities will say to us, you've got to stay home, you can do all this online. I, uh, that, of course, will lead to the question that hasn't been asked yet, but no doubt will be through the afternoon, is what's the business plan in all this? Because it's been terribly costly, and of course, the trial that we've had, you can't download, you can uh, look. You can look, but you can't touch, if you know what I mean. They, you can't download a PDF. So there's obviously going to be uh, a fee structure for this, which I imagine will be fairly complicated, because it's Indian material, or primarily Indian material, South Asian material, and the cost structure in South Asia that's possible for institutions or individuals is going to be very different from the cost structure that would be possible in Singapore. So that's something maybe we can come back to as we go along. Um, uh, for me, playing with the archive was uh, just wonderful in the way that digital things are. Uh, I'm sure everybody here has had experience in the last five or six or seven years of finding things they didn't expect to find on the web, beautifully digitized. But this is just a treasure trove. It's like walking into a cave and finding everything you could possibly imagine in the same place. My, my experience had previously been with things like Google Books and finding editions that I thought no longer existed as a digitized Google book uh, five or six years ago. I'm thinking particularly of the two editions of Duarte Barbosa's travels. The first edition was done in the 1860s and I thought that had vanished because the ones in England are all destroyed by enemy action when you used to look for them in the in the office library or the British Library, but with the Google books even seven or eight years ago suddenly the 1860 edition from Stanford popped up on the screen. But that was a kind of one-off experience. Using this, one finds, uh, well, five million pages worth of it, and materials that I suspect if one spent a lot of time in the India Office Library, uh, one still wouldn't find. And certainly the National Archives of India is a bit of a hit and miss proposition at the best of times. This is all beautifully digitized and, and very fast, which is the other thing that uh, has impressed me. The, uh, um, the, uh, my own interest at the moment is in uh, toilets and sanitation and sewage and waste. And this is, uh, I can tell you, there's a lot of garbage in here. It's uh, a wonderful uh, source for garbage materials. The, uh, my own experience was to put in sanitation. And perhaps at some stage, if Sarah's will do some more demonstrations, you can find the Lucknow Sanitation uh, conference of 1914, which is just a marvelous document where British civil servants primarily came together in Lucknow to report on the state of sanitation in their jurisdictions. And you begin to get, uh, in the course of these very detailed papers, these people were clearly passionate about sewers and rubbish, and uh, you get uh, detailed descriptions of how the sewage system in Bombay either worked or didn't work, what the plans were for the future. And when one uh, travels in India today, you, I've just had uh, a few days in uh, Gujarat, and people will say to you who are in the business of sewage, for example, well, we really don't know where the lines are. There are sewers underneath us that we can't find anymore. Well, one suspects there's a kind of practical policy implication of some of the documents here. There may be hidden maps of the Calcutta sewers that will do a great deal of good when the modern Calcutta sewage system uh, begins to be renovated uh, further. So uh, I think there are all sorts of very practical uses of this. The, the other one that I think is interesting, and again I'd be fascinated to hear the Taylor and Francis uh, developments on this, is whether some of these materials are already being uh, integrated into MOOCs. Now I, I'm not sure what MOOC stands for, it's M-O-O-C-S, but it's the new um, sponsored by the great universities of the world development. Do you know what MOOCs are? Does anybody know what MOOCs are? They're the, the courses that are being developed digitally by a consortium of the great universities intended to be interactive learning of a very kind of participatory kind. It's not simply putting dull lectures on the web. It's developing interactive, uh, highly digitized and clever uh, kinds of courses. The sorts of material here would do exactly what Sharmishta is suggesting, give undergraduates the opportunity to work in very controlled and kind of directed ways with fascinating documents that would uh, give them the same sort of, perhaps, 
the same sort of sense of excitement that people who have done history in the old way used to get when they opened people's trunks and found diaries or old newspapers and so on. So I think there's terrific potential for this to go in all sorts of ways and uh, it will be interesting to talk a little bit more about what you envisage the future of the uh, database being and also about what the kind of business plan is, how it's going to become available. Thank you very much. Um, my, um, I'm a sociologist, so I probably don't have the same kind of uh, needs that uh, historians would have, but I have some uh, interests which I thought were very interesting when I actually explored the, um, the, the archives. But I think my first impression, let me give you my first impressions, uh, it was like having a library on your desktop. I mean, that's really what my first impression was. And I was very pleased to, to have that sense because over the uh, over 40, 50 years, I have used uh, some of the main libraries, the British Library, Bodleian, Yale, Rare Books, and uh, so as. And I can tell you that you can't actually go and, and I used to have great fun going into all these libraries and actually feel the books. I think if you haven't done that, it's worth doing it. Because remember, these uh, libraries are now becoming more and more restricted. I go to British Library, I have to put in a request, and I get the books. I go to Bodleian, I put a request, and I get I have to wait for half an hour, an hour, depending on how, the li how busy the librarian is. And the only place where I can actually now go and actually feel the books is the SOAS. That's you still open shelf, and you can actually go and wander around. Uh, I, I think the, so it, it's just the, um, you don't have to travel and you have the opportunity of having library on your desktop. Uh, in particular, the, my second impression was that I, I, I think uh, as a student uh, and now as a visitor in Pakistan, the libraries are terrible, in very bad shape. Uh, I remember in my college, libraries used to be under lock and key. And so you have to go and ask the librarian what you want, and they will come and open the, open the, the shelf and get you the book. And I think it's really, uh, it was very depressing because you, you just wanted to have a look at the book and you have to go and get somebody to unlock it. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the same practice still at the Punjab University in Lahore. But in any case, I think uh, this will mean that you don't need a librarian who will be unlocking the books, uh, bookshelves. You can actually go and look at the books. Uh, my, uh, I, I, I was exploring the topic because I have two interests which I, thus, I would like to have a look at. One is the caste system in India. And uh, I think one of the great books in that is the Denzel Ebbetson, uh, how do you pronounce it? Uh, Ebbetson, Ebbetson's book. And of course, I have a book. I actually have that book copy and I was very pleased that it actually is on, on, the, on the archives. And my other interest was to actually uh, shrines, the Catholic, uh, Hindu, and uh, Muslim shrines in medieval India, and what kind of activities they, they, were, um, they, they were engaged in. Um, in particular, I was interested in Muslim shrines, and I actually, when I, uh, I typed shrines, I got an enormous number of references, and I must admit, most of them really had very little to do with shrines until I actually went and explored further. I didn't have the time, but I thought they were, they were not really relevant, but uh, something you probably need to refine as, as you go along. But I came across a really a fascinating uh, book, which I had never, uh, uh, I didn't know existed. Uh, I, I knew a book by Nizami on this topic, but there's a book by Kunawar Muhammad Ashraf, Life and Conditions of People of Hindustan, 1200 to uh, 1559, and it's a fascinating account. I mean, you can actually spend time reading about and imagine, you know, what people were actually doing. It has accounts of all kinds of things that people used to do. Uh, my, uh, so it, it, it was actually, a, a, you know, a, a, a very great um, a sense of satisfaction that I thought that uh, the digitization has moved in such a way that actually people interested in South Asia can have access to material which they would not have. And secondly, it will, it will overcome the limitations of libraries, the absence of good libraries in South Asia. I can't speak for India, I can't speak for Bangladesh, but I can speak for Pakistan. 
the libraries in Pakistan are really not in, in great shape. And I think this would be, a, particularly those who are interested in historical uh, uh, studies uh, and, and uh, anthropological studies, I think it would be a gold mine. Um, the, the, my main uh, interest is that, you know, the, the students and the faculty in these countries, of course you're making this accessible, but what are the barriers to accessibility? I think the, if you look at the students, I think the same kind of issues that I, that Robin has alluded to, I would like to allude to. I mean, what is the business plan? How are you going to make it accessible? I mean, I was trying to, um, obviously I was very keen to um, print some pages and I was, I mean, obviously I saw that, you know, you can't print during the trial period. And when I actually tried to print something, uh, it, the print is actually, the original text is very, very, very uh, small, and I, I think it's five fonts or six fonts, but it may well be uh, just because of the trial period. I think my main, um, uh, I want to compliment uh, Taylor and Francis for, for making this valuable, uh, for making the investment to make this uh, valuable body of knowledge accessible to, to humankind, not only in South Asia, but everywhere. And secondly, I would like to know how uh, do you have any research uh, on the barriers to accessibility? It's all right in Singapore, it's all right in, in the UK, but if you really look at the student body who probably could benefit most in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, are elsewhere, but I'm talking particularly people in South Asia, students in South Asia, and teachers in South Asia, I think it's very important to uh, find, uh, to, to get a sense from, from you uh, whether you have done any research on accessibility, barriers to accessibility, and, and do you think that would be a, a problem in making, in accessing to this very valuable investment you have made? Thanks very much. Thanks, Maria. I have a couple of, uh, of comments and a fair number of questions, some of them Robin and Professor Hassan have raised. But let me begin by sharing with uh, all of you my excitement at what I discovered, a couple of things in the archives. So I, of course, when you get into an archives, you are thinking about your work, but often uh, we historians get distracted. And I began by searching for material on cricket, because I know this is something which Boria is deeply passionate about. So what did I discover? So can we perhaps look at uh, the piece which, uh, this one, thank you. So this is a piece from the Indian Cricket Almanac of 1949. And this is written by the Nawab of Patadi, the senior Nawab of Patadi, who is uh, Nawab Iftikhar Ali Khan Patadi, the father of Mansur Ali Khan. And this has the title, What is Wrong with Indian, Indian Cricket? And this is, you know, when you begin to read it, it's an amazing piece. It sort of talks about um, how, you know, this is a question which is always asked. And this is a question, I think, then it goes on to talk about what he thinks is wrong <coughs> with Indian cricket. He goes on to say that I don't think anything is wrong with Indian cricket. It's just that we are... Um, I have some notes here. I drew up a memorandum for the Board of Cricket con Control of, for Cricket in India. The only point is that we th he says that, you know, we have three advantages. We are supple and agile. We have, we have keen eyes, eyesight and supple ways. We can play the game throughout the year. So he says that Indians are naturally very good in terms of their potential for cricket. It goes on and then it says that, you know, we should be looking for talent, not just from the Ranji Trophy matches, but from, uh, you know, college matches. So this is one thing. The other thing which I discovered, which is about religion, and this is a piece uh, called Kedarnath and Badrinath, a pilgrim's diary by Sister Nivedita, uh, one, of the, one of the persons associated with the Ramakrishna mission. This is a pilgrimage which she performed in the first, I think probably in 1898. And this is the diary of that trip. So uh, this 
in some ways begins within detailed itinerary. So places, distance in miles, remarks. And it says that, you know, this is a kind of a modern day uh, kind of a guide to pilgrimage. And then it says that she wrote this diary so that people could, can actually calculate how much time they need and what distance, how much uh, supplies and resources they'll need. So the very notion of, you know, mod when one talks about modernity and Hinduism and of course Vivekananda and uh, Ramakrishna Mission are very central to that. You know, the whole notion of time, you know, you need five days to go to this pilgrim. I think is a very interesting notion itself. So I think there are gems like this here in the archives. But, and of course, you know, the digital sort of segment of the archives has been growing and how, how exciting it has been in the last seven, eight years, you know, as you discovered. Uh, I have been discovering, for example, the British Foreign Office records, the US State Department records, the presidential archives, which have a lot of material, the Kennedy and the Johnson archives. The, um, then there are some wonderful community project resources, the Indian Memory Project, for example, the Gandhi Heritage Portal, which was launched uh, just in the early month, early part of September, which is an amazing resource. Uh, giving Gandhi's collected works in Hindi, uh, English and Gujarati. So a lot is going on and I think, but that's been going on in a kind of a, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's not sort of coordinated and I think this is the first structured effort which uh, one sees, which Borya and Shavishta have put together with Routledge, with Taylor and Francis, which is really focused on a particular region, which is systematically trying to build up resources uh, for the modern period and of course uh, the resources are uh, you know I mean they need to be built up further and they need to be broadened in terms of regional focus in terms of country focus a lot of them tend to be on India but and it's a, I think a very important dimension of this could be the cross-border access which we don't have about other countries in the region so I'm you know I've been interested in partition but it's impossible for me to work in a Pakistani archives. Uh, I teach on Sri Lanka, but it's hard to uh, find. Uh, so it's possible the border crossing nature of these archives. I think this is a very important dimension for as we build this resource, particularly, um, you know, we have a common history between India, Bangladesh, Pakistan uh, for so many uh, years, so many centuries, but we can't access that history because resources have been divided. So this is a very important dimension. Um, of course, you know, this is not, as Sharmishta pointed out, this is not a substitute for the real archives. It complements that effort. And I think it's important because, you know, there are young people here who are starting about thinking about their projects, who are going to be pursuing research at the doctoral level, at the master's level, beyond that. So they should have a fairly realistic appreciation of what is entailed, how challenging it is. Uh, the whole challenge of getting a research visa, you know, negotiating the sort of physical environment of archives, the, uh, the, the policies which are not very helpful. Um, you know, of course, as you go down to the, in New Delhi and in Islamabad, they, you know, you may have access, you go down to regional archives, the situation is different. So I think it's a wonderful resource in that respect. And of course, uh, we have to think about, you know, how we can contribute, whether there is a collaborative model, whether there is a, what is the business plan? A very important question about students and college, uh, you know, researchers being able to access it at what subscription, you know, um, in India. I think this is the issue for all sort of intellectual uh, you know, the, the, those of us who publish uh, or, you know, even people who bring out journals, I think this is a problem of pricing, differential pricing. And then, of course, whether the model which you are going to take it forward, is it going to be collaborative? So are you going to invite, say, partnership institutions? Hmm? Uh, there are wonderful libraries, private libraries, institutional libraries who may be interested. There may be important researchers who may want to, you know, 
who may want to contribute, give their materials and books and so on. So those are questions which uh, we hope to will get discussed. Thank you.